Hello dear friends, welcome to Life Spirit Reports of Life After Life. We're meeting on Kardec Radio every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Pacific, Pacific Standard Time, which is 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we have been studying Heaven and Hell, the second part of Heaven and Hell. We've, been, we've learned how we can prepare ourselves best for our transition. That is inevitable. We all will experience leaving our physical shell behind. And what we've learned is that the single most important thing for us to prepare ourselves for our trans uh, transition is our inner transformation. That we work on becoming better people, more open-hearted, more charitable, which the good spirits translated for us as being more indulgent, benevolent, and for forgiving. In order to support ourselves further of how we conduct ourselves in a more aligned way with God's will to be more kind and loving and charitable, we've been studying the cases of the happy spirits, which is the first category that Alan Kardec presents to us in heaven and hell in the second half of heaven and hell and we've been looking at what these happy spirits who were shall we say um, morally transformed enough to actually find a happy situation on the other side and we've been studying and learning from these spirits to see what we can incorporate into our lives every day a little bit more in order to prepare ourselves and what they are modeling to us and reporting back to us these happy spirits so far is all in alignment with our inner transformation to recognize as God as our guiding force and Jesus as our guide and model so that we can be completely aligned and we know that God's law is written in our conscience so if we take the time and we tune into ourselves preferably all day long but some of us maybe just do it in the evening at the end of the day as a daily review we will know where we need a little more work so last week we discussed the case of miss emma she was a famous ballerina and she burned to death actually her costume caught on fire and she lived another six months until she transitioned and we learned from her about resignation and we heard we learned from her about praying and uh, establishing a very close connection with our spirit guides and now what we're doing today is we are going to study Miss Anne Gourdon I'm saying it with a French accent I hope I'm doing it justice um, so Miss Anne we will call her and she is another happy spirit before we do that, I want to say hi to our community. I want to check in and welcome Tony very much. Thank you for joining, Tony. It's always a pleasure to have you. And Teresa Castro, thank you so much, dear friend, for joining. So lovely. And So Souza, hello. Thank you, friends. It's a pleasure to have you here. So, Mrs. Anne, and she can be found on page 315 of Heaven and Hell. Mrs. Gourdon, a very young woman known for her gentle character and eminent moral qualities, passed away in November of 1860. She belonged to a family of miners from around Saint Etienne, a circumstance that made her spiritual position quite interesting. So Mrs. Gourdon, Miss Anne, was born <clears throat> into a family of miners and it turns actually it turns out that she was quite an evolved spirit but she chose to be in this family and of course the family chose to have her as a child and we will look at that a little more deeply in a minute suffice it to say she was young and she passed away at a young age in her ev ev first evocation alan Kardec asks her why were you taken from your family's affections at such a young age? And her answer is, <clears throat> because I had finished my earthly trials. 
Then the, the next question is, can you see your relatives sometimes? And the answer is, oh, I'm always nearby. And then he asks, are you a happy spirit? But before we look at the answer for that, we want to go back to the first question. And that is, and why, and I, why were you taken from your family's affection at such a young age? Now we know that just as an example, what's going on right now in the United States with those shooting events um, happening quite often lately. And we find at times even children being shot to death or younger people um, also in school shootings. And we may ask ourselves, how does that make sense that a young person needs to die in circumstances like that. And of course, some of us may have had that experience with family members, or we have friends, or we of course hear it on the news, where so often very young people die. And one of the questions that a lot of people ask themselves, is that fair? This person still had so much to live for. But let us look and see what we learn from the gospel according to spiritism and what, the, what Alan Kardec and the good spirits found out for us. So first we're gonna to go to the gospel according to spiritism, page 115. Page 115 is part of chapter um, five, blessed are the afflicted. And there is um, one chapter, which is actually item 21, and it is Sanson, who we actually, he was one of the first spirits whose account we studied he was part of the Parisian um, Spiritist Society that Alan Kardec formed. And so Sanson is teaching us the following. And you may remember he was a pretty wise spirit. He was one of the happy spirits and he found um, a lot of goodness on the other side with very little suffering during the, the transition. So he says, when death comes to reap a harvest in your families, indiscriminately taking the youngest before the older, you often say, God is not just, since he sacrifices the one who is strong and has a great future while preserving those who have already lived many years full of disappointment, taking those who are useful and leaving behind those who no, no, no longer are, and breaking a mother's heart by depriving her of the innocent creature that was her whole joy. Sound familiar, dear friends? We may have had those thoughts, right? And maybe particularly lately when we listen to the news. He continues on to say, nothing is done without an intelligent purpose. So he tells us that there is always a purpose at work. And no matter what happens, everything has its reason for being. If you were to better scrutinize all the pains that strike you, you would always find in them a driving reason a regenerating reason and your miserable self-interest would be a secondary consideration that you would relegate to last place. So Sanson is very direct here with us. He's basically telling us, have faith. There is a bigger picture. We always have to remember that when we look at life, that our vision is small. It is almost like we look through a keyhole into a whole room, maybe a mansion, a huge parlor and what do we see the keyhole perspective of that whole room and we humans have a tendency to judge our world based on the limitations of our mind based on this keyhole perspective and here is Sanson with a very consoling message inviting us to look at it differently and he keeps saying premature death is frequently a great blessing that God grants to those who depart thus preserving them from the miseries of life or the seductions that could have led them to their loss. Those who die in the flower of youth are not victims of fatalism, not rather God deemed it useful for them not to remain on earth any longer. Friends, what a beautiful message. Don't we feel all a little more relieved and happy to know that all these deaths that we hear about and we've experienced and we know are happening where children die, young people die. 
there is a bit big reason behind it and it's actually that they have completed their earth's mission that they are actually allowed to leave the school of earth so it is actually a gift dear friends so let us this is the invitation for us tonight tonight to rewrite our stories of the keyhole perspective to look at the bigger picture and have trust and faith in God. There is nothing happening in this world that is not meant to happen and has a good reason behind it. So when we move on to the next page, which is page 116, we have Fenelon, who is giving us another piece of information. He says, if he had been a good man, he would have he would have died. Well then, in saying this, you state the truth, because it just so happens that God often gives to a spirit who is still budding on the path of progress, a longer trial than to a good spirit, who is a reward for its merit, will receive the grace of its trial, being as short as possible. Dear friends, another beautiful consoling message. Now we're being taught that it is actually a blessing, it's a gift to be allowed to excarnate at a younger age because that means we do not need to go through more vicissitudes of this life. We've completed our mission and we're allowed to leave uh, this, these earthly trials in the flesh, which we all know is a difficult path behind. And he says also, the one who has departed has completed his task, friends. So whoever excarnates, and even under circumstances of what we're learning these days, with these terrible shootings, the one who has departed has completed his task, and that pertains to any age. Whereas the one who remains perhaps has not even begun, friends. Maybe we are the ones who haven't even begun or we are just beginning on our path. And those souls who are freed from the earthly path, they are, they are the ones who may celebrate the gift of being able to move on. He also says, understand therefore, another invitation friends, understand therefore that true freedom consists in deliverance from the bonds of the body and that as long as you are on the earth you are in captivity friends we are in captivity and those souls who move on are freer Acc accustom yourselves not to criticize what you cannot understand and believe that god is just in all things let us breathe into that dear friends i am I can't, I am, um, how should I say, there is, no, there is no coincidence that this message comes through tonight. We haven't planned it. I had nothing to do with it, but I was moved to picking out this particular spirit and see what comes through. It helps us, doesn't it? It helps us with what is going on in the world. I would think so. And it allows us to understand why these spirits are allowed to move on and we're not complete so we're staying and we're learning and we have this beautiful platform of cardiac radio and the even more amazing teachings that spiritism offers us that we can still work on perfecting ourselves now we go to page 118 and we're still in the gospel according to spiritism and here is Delphine and we visited her last week as well and she's telling us about true misfortune because we often don't see what is really a misfortune we sometimes label things as misfortune that are not and here she's telling us I have come to not I have come to tell you that nearly everyone nearly everyone is mistaken and that true misfortune is not everything that people believe it to be and when we lose a loved ones or when we observe you know other people losing their loved ones let us keep that in mind dear friends that it is not up to us to judge this is God's plan and it sounds like it is a gift then he she says they see it in poverty so the hardship we see on, on earth we see it in poverty 
We see it in threatening creditors. We see it in a cradle empty of that angel. We see it in the coffin. See, friends, when somebody excarnates. We see it in tears. We see it in anguish of betrayal. But, she's saying, for those who are seeing nothing but the present, that is a misfortune. But true misfortune is found more in the consequences of a thing than in the thing itself. So when somebody excarnates at a young age like Miss Anne, let us not judge. Let us not be the ones who focus on what, what we can't really judge with our smallness of our mind, our small perspective. But let us keep in mind that maybe the consequence of what we see as hardship is a gift for us or for the others that there is a bigger picture and again we're invited to trust God to have faith but sometimes we're winning a large amount of money or um, we have a beautiful vacation that is gifted to us and we all forget about charity because as we've learned before it is fortune that is one of the harshest trials because we as humans have a tendency to completely forget about those who are more in need and consequently what appears to be a huge gift and is a positive thing and we're all cel celebratory turns out to be actually a harsh trial for us. So friends, let us go back to Miss Anne and let us see. So she says, she's being asked, are you a happy spirit? And the answer is, I am. I hope, wait, and love. The heavens do not scare me, and I wait with confidence and love for the sprouting of my white wings. So she is hoping, waiting, and loving. So it sounds like she has a lot of patience, which is a virtue, which is something that we are too invited to, um, what is the word, to nourish in ourselves. Patience, love, prayer, surrender of the heart, trusting in God's will. So she's dreaming of the white wings, friends. And then the, the next question is, what do you mean by white wings? And the answer is, when I become a pure spirit, as resplendent as the celestial messengers who are dazzling me. So Miss Anne must have been a quite a evolved spirit because it sounds like she's surrounded by high level spirits. And of course she was allowed to excarnate at a young age and she chose to live among more humble folks than what her moral development displayed. And the, the a footnote to the white wings that she's mentioning um, that Alan Kardec offers to us says, the wings of angels, archangels, and seraphim, who are nothing more than pure spirits, are obviously only an attribute imagined by humans to portray the speed at which they move. For their ethereal nature makes any aid unnecessary for crossing space. So we're learning that that is not really necessary for the spirits to move about in space. And we know from the André Louise series how often he and other spirits, and of course spirits he observes, they volatate and without wings. And so as we're learning, wings are not necessary, but that is what she is thinking of. However, this footnote continues to add, they may appear to humans with such accessories to be in harmony with human thought, just as spirits take on the appearance they had on earth in order to be recognizable. So that is a common picture that we humans have. We know it from the ancient times in paintings and stories that angels have wings. And I went online in order to take a look and see what is actually being, um, check a second, I'm trying to get it, in an article that's not spiritist, why it is so often that we think of higher level beings as beings who have wings. 
And so what we're learning here is angels and wings go together naturally in popular culture. Images of winged angels are commonplace on everything from tattoos to greeting cards. Right, friends, we know that. And we learn that the sacred texts of three major world religions, namely Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all contain verses about angel wings. And then we hear that um, angels are powerful spiritual creatures who aren't bound by the law of physics, and we know that from spiritism as well. So they don't need wings to fly. Yet people who have encountered angels sometimes report that the angels they saw had wings. And they're being described as beings of light and that they have an aura that's extremely bright and light and, and entail the colors of the rainbow. And then they say, um, the wings that angels sometimes feature when appearing to human beings serve as symbols of God's power and loving care for people. So it has a symbolic meaning that um, higher level beings are often ex um, painted and expressed and described as having wings. So when we go to uh, Leon Denis after death, um, in, on page, let me see, it was on page 239, which is um, chapter, let us see, 34, Errant Souls. He describes the high level spirits not with wings, but here's what he says. In the higher worlds, the empire of matter is less, and the evils that arise from it are attenuated as the souls progress until they gradually disappear. We know that through our inner moral transformation and acknowledge, um, uh, learning more, acquiring more knowledge, we evolve, and consequently, we're less ignorant which is the definition that we learn from the spirits book for evil. Evil was defined by the high level spirits as being ignorant. The being moves freely, so the high level being moves freely, no longer constrained to crawl painfully upon the ground, overwhelmed by the weight of a too heavy atmosphere. That's us friends. Bodily wants are few and heavy labor is unknown. It's quite lovely to imagine, isn't it? The poor spirits, dazzling with light, um, group themselves in families. Their brightness and the very tints of their fluidic envelopes portray their attributes and the degree of their elevation. Heavenly harmonies resound, compared to which earthly music would seem but as discordant noise. Oh, friends. Can you imagine what a lovely picture that is once we become high level spirits? And can you imagine that our music is being described by them as discordant noise? Yes, we have a lot to look forward to. We just need to do the work, right friends? Inner transformation. The setting is the infinite space where the world's revolving in its immensity and uniting their notes to the celestial voices in the universal hymn which ascends to God. It is a very poetic um, chapter. He describes in even greater detail the beauty that awaits us in the higher worlds. And Miss Anne is giving us a little bit of a glimpse that she has seen those spirits and she's dreaming of becoming one of them. So on page 316, we're moving back to Miss Anne because now the next question that she's being asked is, can your relatives do anything on your behalf? So can your relatives help you? And she says, and this is very interesting and lots for us to learn, they can stop saddening me with their mourning. They know I'm not lost forever to them. I want their memory of me to be sweet, light, and fragrant. My stay on earth was like a flower's and nothing sorrowful should remain of that brief stay. Friends, Miss Anne is teaching us yet another piece of the coin. First, we're invited to see younger or anyone passing away, so to speak, passing away, leaving their earthly shell behind as a gift, as a lesson learned, and as an as a invitation to move on. 
as something positive. And now we're being invited to not mourn, to actually, we're helping the spirit who has moved on by not mourning. We're actually again displaying a lack of faith into the bigger picture and into the justice of God, into what needs to happen and is supposed to happen in every single situation. Now let us pause for a moment and let us go to the Spirit's book for this and let us see what we can add as in information to this. So in the Spirit's book it is page 936 which is must be question 936. <laughs> 936. Sometimes we're making a mistake and then it becomes confusing. So, um, yes, so 936, it's in part four of the Spirit's book, Earthly Joys and Sor Sorrows, is the name of the chapter. And there's a sub-chapter, and it is labeled The Loss of Loved Ones. And the invitation for us is there to study that chapter because it will further help us to understand and learn as to how to assess how to deal with the losses that we are being faced with, each and every one of us right now in the United States, perhaps in a different way, which does not excuse what's happening. Don't get me wrong, friends. I'm just trying, we're just trying to give a little bit of a different consoling um, perspective that might help us to adjust it ourselves in a different way. So question 936, which we're finding on page 523 in the Spirits book. And here's the question that Alan Kardec so wisely asked the spirits. How does the inconsolable sorrow of those who remain on earth affect the spirits who are its object? So Alan Kardec is wondering, how does the sorrow that we feel in view of losing a loved one, and maybe even as a collective sorrow in the United States right now, how does that serve the ones who have excarnated. Let us see what the answer is. A spirit is, a sensit is sensitive to the memory and grief of those it has loved. But persistent and unreasonable sorrow affects it grievously because it sees in such excess a lack of faith in the future and trust in God and consequently an obstacle to progress and perhaps to their reunion in the spirit world. My dear friends, we are invited to see that we're actually not only disrespecting God's will, we're being in a, in a way a little rebellious. We are not being faithful. We're invited to be more having more faith in God's actions and we are doing the spirit who has excarnated a disservice. They're very um, sensitive beings. They feel the pain that we are feeling and it doesn't allow them to move on and, and meet with the higher level spirits. It is like a force and we're keeping them tied to us, to our lower vibration here on earth. So friends, this is really important information, isn't it? And I'm hoping that this will help us all to deal with the grief that we're all in one form or another experiencing. He, case, he continues to say in a small print, this is the footnote to the answer. When a spirit is happier than it was on the earth, to regret that it has left this life behind is to regret that it is happy. So in other words, it is not respecting where the spirit was excarnated is at we're in a way selfishly wrapped up in our own selves, in our own not being able to see the bigger picture, in our own lack of faith, in our own lack of alignment with God's will. And he says, two friends are prisoners in the same jail. This is an example. Both of them are to be freed someday, but one of them is freed first. That's the excarnation, right? Would it be right on the part of the one who remains in prison to be saddened that his friend has been set free before him? Good question, right? Is there, would there not be on this part more selfishness than affection in wishing that his friend would remain in captivity and suffer as long as himself? 
true. It's very, it's a very good point, friends. And we are invited to understand that, that grief is a form of selfishness and not actually respecting. And it's understandable. I mean, we're, we're not minimizing grief, obviously, no question. But here is another layer. And for our moral transformation, that's important. That we, it's part of our moral transformation to understand that we're actually doing a disservice on all levels and we're causing pain for ourselves and the spirit who has moved on. And isn't it true that then we're sad, we're in the prison cell and then our friend is being released and then we go into moaning and growing and kicking and sc sc screaming instead of being happy for them. And how often, and this is a therapeutic question for us, how often are we happy for others' fortune? For the moments that they are celebrating or are we more of those type of people who kind of become envious and kind of ask ourselves well what about me and why am I not that fortunate and we become envious and last week we heard that jealousy and envy are one of those um, voluntary sufferings that don't serve us at all so the beatitude but Jesus is the attitude, blessed are the more are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We won't be comforted when we go into envy. And grief is uh, it's almost like a hidden form of envy, isn't it? It's because we are not happy that they are, we can't quite see that it's actually a good thing for them. That's really, I think, what it is. But now we know better, right, friends? And then he says, um, the same applies to two persons who love each other on the earth. The one who departs first is the first to be freed, and the other should be happy, patiently waiting for this moment when he or she will also be liberated. What a beautiful message, friends, right? Something to celebrate for us. I hope we're all feeling a little relieved to see the bigger picture. So now, let us go back to Miss Anne and another question for her. How can your language be so poetic? and so little in keeping with your position while on earth. So she, they finding out that her, her voice is very, that her speech is very poetic. And it's kind of like in contrast to the family she was uh, born and raised into. So here we go, and we're going to read. It is my soul that speaks, Miss Anne says. Yes, I possess previously acquired knowledge knowledge. Also, God often allows delicate spirits to incarnate amongst more rustic men to enable them to perceive the refinement and understanding they will acquire later on. So I'll repeat this. I possess previously acquired knowledge. So we know that through reincarnation, we are all on different lo levels of our soul development. And she was already a little more advanced. And then she says, God often allows delicate spirits, so spirits that are more morally um, and also intellectually advanced, to incarnate among more rustic men, so less evolved people, to enable them to, to, enable them to perceive the refinement and understanding they will acquire later on. So it's almost like a mission. They're being helped along by the spirit that was incarnated in their family. And the small print reads, before we pause and then we go to the spirit's book to educate ourselves further. He says in the small print, without this highly logical explanation, which is so much in harmony with God's kindness towards God's creatures, it would be difficult to understand what might at first glance seem to be an anomaly. In reality though, what could be more poetic and gracious than the language of this refined young woman in the midst of the roughest work environment. The opposite often occurs as well. Low order spirits incarnate among highly advanced peoples, but for the opposite purpose. It is for their own advancement that God places them in contact with an enlightened environment for their instruction or so that they might act as an instrument of trial. What other philosophy could resolve such anomalies? Yes, friends. Let us express our gratitude to spiritism and the high-level spirits who are allowing us 
to receive this knowledge which really helps us with our lives here on earth. So we're learning that there are two different scenarios that are not the norm. And that is that either like Miss Anne, sometimes spirits, higher level spirits, incarnate into families that are less evolved. And they do that more for a mission. Or they're on a mission to help those souls in the family to advance, to set an example, to teach them. And the reverse is true too at times, where lower level spirits choose to incarnate into families that are much more evolved. And in that case, it is often a um, charitable gift that the parents giving to this less evolved soul. Um, and also it is for them to teach and for the soul to learn, which is the opposite in Miss Anne's case. Now let us see what we can learn from the spirits book. So we're going to question 197 in the Spirits book. Question 197. And it is in chapter 4. The plurality of existences. The fate of children after death. And we're learning, is the spirit of a child who dies very young as advanced as that of an adult? So this is a little bit as an aside. So the question that Alan Kardec, what he's wondering about, is whether the spirit of a child who dies very young, which Miss Anne kind of falls into that category, as advanced as that of an adult. So are they equally advanced? You know, in other words, could a child actually be, a soul at a younger age in a physical body, be equally evolved as the parents? And we know already the answer, right? But let's look what, what we're learning here. Sometimes much more so because the child may have had more existences and may have therefore acquired more experiences, especially if he or she has progressed. So not only are sometimes children at the same level as their parents, but they can even be more advanced, he's telling us. And we also know, of course, they can be less advanced. So then in question 207, which is, Physical and moral likeness, chap part of chapter four and part two, plurality of existences in the spirits book. He now asks, parents almost always transmit a physical likeness to their children. Do they also transmit a moral likeness? Aha, so we know that we look often like our parents or we have similarities, right? So that's more the material likeness, the physical likeness of our bodies. But then what about our soul, he's wondering. So do we display, um, do we have a moral likeness with our family members, our parents as well? And the answer is no, because their souls or spirits are different. So, so he's saying, do they also transmit a moral likeness? So do we as parents transmit a moral likeness? And the answer is no, friends. No, we do not as parents because their souls, namely our children's souls or spirits are different. The body proceeds from the body, but the spirit does not proceed from the spirit. There is no other link than blood kinship amongst descendants. So that's our only link. Yet there is the aspect of affinity, of course, because there is a reason why we group together in families and sometimes over many lifetimes, we recycle the relationships. And that is because we have a moral likeness. Most of us in general, generally speaking, are in similar moral developments and, that's, and have affinity. And that's why we incarnate in family groups. But let us go and let us go to question 209. Why is it that good and virtuous parents sometimes have bad children? <laughs> He's saying bad children. In other words, why don't the good qualities of the parents always out of affinity attract good spirits as their children? So now Alan Kardec is wondering why it is that good and virtuous parents sometimes have not so good and virtuous children. And why isn't the quality, the soul qualities transmitted to the child? And the answer is bad spirits let us, I would prefer the word less evolved spirits. Let us say less evolved, he says, bad spirits may ask for good parents in the hope 
that their counsels will guide them along a better path. God often grants their wish. See, on that level, when the spirit that we have as a child is less evolved than we are, then it is in order for them to learn. And of course, in the other case, in Miss Anne's case, where she was more evolved than her, her parents, the parents have the invitation, the opportunity to learn from her. And she probably went in on a mission to help them out of her charity, out of her love. So then when we go to Thought and Life, our beloved book, Thought and Life, chapter 11, Actually, Emmanuel really confirms all of this and wraps it up nicely for us. Chapter 11 in Thought and Life is called The Cradle. It's a beautiful book, a wonderful chapters, so rich. And again, we're just scraping on the surface. We're just giving some nuggets and hopefully you will be moved to following up and maybe reading the whole chapter. And here we learn, the road we initiate in any new existence is the continuation of the road we traveled in previous existences. So it's all just one big road. Different lifetimes, different bodies, different relationships. And then he says, um, the predominant mental reflex of our individuality will be impressed on the fetal plate within the uterine chamber. So we are co-creators of our own physical body in our own, we are co-creating our cradle, which means we're also co-creators in picking our parents in our situation. And then he says, we are usually born on earth in accordance with our debts or our needs. So that explains why we are sometimes spirits who are less evolved in a more evolved family setting or more evolved than the less evolved ones because we have needs to either teach or learn. But it also explains when we are matched up in our moral, uh, moral evolution with our parents because then too our, our mission, our path in this lifetime is matched up, matched up with our needs of what we need to learn. But we're always in co-creation, we're learning and we are teaching, even as parent and in the parent-child relationship. We're learning from our children. Sometimes people with generous hearts and the will to endure sacrifice bring into their lives some suffering souls, thus temporarily carrying in their arms real challenges far below the level of progress already reached. So here Emmanuel is confirming what we've learned from the Spirit's book and actually also heaven and hell. That it is possible that we are at different levels of our evolve, evolvement, uh, evolution. And even though Mrs. Anne's case is the opposite, we thought it would be good to show, to explain why these cases exist on both sides of the coin. And then when we go to chapter 12, which is the next chapter, again, fascinating and also relevant for what we're studying today. It's called the family. We learn family relationships can be considered an important basis of our mental reflexes. So in other words, we, where we find ourselves, we usually, as children, under the mental reflexes, always influenced of, under the, of the mental if reflexes of our families. So they may be good or bad, so sometimes we learn things that are not so good and they increase our trials in our lives then. But sometimes we'll also learn really good things from our family members. But the bottom line is we're always under the influence, so to speak. Such reflexes can be pleasant or unpleasant according to what the past brings back to us. And of course, all of this is our, needs to be looked at against our timeline of our eternal life from lifetime to lifetime. We cannot escape the ladder of evolution. We do not, of course, include his spirits from elevated levels. Now, this is pertaining to Mrs. Anne. So we just heard that these mental reflexes are can be pleasant or unpleasant and that we are usually matched up in our evolution with our parents, our family members. But, of course, we do not, of course, include his spirits from elevated levels that pioneer evolution. When brought to dwell in a commonplace environment like Mrs. Anne, they quickly overcome it. 
by creating a mental climate of their own. They then proceed with the task of renewal that they came to accomplish. So when we have a child, or like Mrs. Sané, who was more evolved than her parents, and the mental reflexes were most likely not matching up really well. Whatever the influence the parents were giving to Anne did not really gain a foothold as much as in a situation where we're more matched up. Because these higher level spirits like Mrs. Anne, they are more evolved. They are not as easily swayed by lower vibrational thought patterns, less evolved thought patterns. So this is really interesting, friends, right? This explains why she is so evolved, why she's so poetic, and she did not speak the language of her parents, which according to Ellen Kardec were more crude because she was a higher level spirit and more on her own path already, like Jesus. Jesus came from very humble background, and we know he, as the governor of this planet, what she brought to us and that came because he was very close to connected to God he was very evolved so let's see is there more I think that explains to us um, why and it also explains why we sometimes you know have these genius these prodigy children in families that may not even be musical and the child is a genius on the piano and exactly for the same reason right um, because they're more evolved already so friends that wraps up today's lesson of mrs Anne, and it is with gratitude to the good spirits um, that we had this beautifully befitting message for today after the shootings that happened that hopefully help us a little bit to put um, the deaths into perspective not to make any excuses, but to see it from a little bit of a different angle. And in closing, we would like, if you can, invite you to close your eyes and open up your hearts and minds to connect with our beloved, just Mother, Father, God, and our beloved Jesus Christ, the most beautiful guide and model and all the good spirits and spirit mentors that are surrounding us during this lesson and every day. And we are thanking you from the bottom of our hearts for these beautiful, consoling messages that we receive continuously, befitting our current life situations to help us, invite us to see the bigger picture and consequently practice our faith in the all-loving, just, or benevolent God, to understand that everything is happening according to divine design, and so that we may rather pray for those who have committed crimes, but also pray for those who have passed on, allowing them to continue with their path without binding them further to planet Earth. We're invited to remember to see it as a blessing, as the right, rightness of God's choice for them to be allowed to release the earthly chains. And we are further invited to rejoice at their path and releasing our grief and selfishness around the losses we may have experienced. And with this beautiful invitation to take into our next week, we're asking humbly for permission to close tonight's gathering, and so be it. Dear friends, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for listening to this important message and so God willing, we will see you next week, same time, same place. We have most likely one more happy spirit, and then we will move on to a different category. Much love, and have a beautiful week, friends. Goodbye.